Hi sunshines, welcome back to my channel. I am going to be doing a get ready with me today because I am heading out later so I thought it would be fun to just show you guys a bit of the process. <laughs> I don't really do makeup. I'm not a makeup expert. I'm more of a makeup total beginner. I've only ever used it to go for dance performances and stuff and stage makeup is totally not the same as day to day. I'm just going to start off with my skincare routine first and then go into the makeup -y bit in a bit. And I'm also going to be just chatting to you guys about kind of like thoughts on current issues as well. So yeah, it's more of like a chatty get ready with me and um, let's have a conversation. Okay, so I've just washed my face and I'm going to start off with the ordinary hyaluronic acid. My sister told me that the way that I rub skincare into my face is super aggressive. Like, I don't bother to massage it nicely. I kind of just spread it around with my entire hand. <laughs> but it's just efficient, you know? So I start off with this because it's supposed to be moisturizing. And I like that it's really lightweight. It really just absorbs into your face and it doesn't leave any kind of cast whatsoever. But because my skin is quite irritated from retinol sometimes, which I use at night, I like to follow up with another moisturizer. This is um, just a lightweight one by Simple. I am not sure if you can get this in Singapore though because my dad does get this from Malaysia. They discontinued the blue line after a while, like a couple of years back. So I just take about this much and then spread it as evenly as I can. So one of the things that I really wanted to touch on in this video, I remember, is something that I just watched like 10 minutes ago. It's this video by Zula um, where Leah, the host, is interviewing Chow about how she, how she uses like her role as an influencer to, and treats it as a job to like pad up her finances and just make sure that she's financially secure, you know, because being an influencer is a job if you are monetizing it. Um, it's not actually about the whole financial aspect of it, but one point where Chow was saying how she was commenting about how her looks have obviously played a part in um, her growth as an influencer because as we all know, um, a large part about being an influencer is kind of how you look, right? And how you present yourself to the public and to your followers. She was saying how her looks in that, you know, she's very pretty <laughs> as a person. Um, not that she said that she was very pretty or anything, but she's saying how her looks um, definitely may have contributed to her exposure as a local influencer. And that does implicitly kind of imply that if you don't have the kind of looks that people want to see and are seeking to view on their screens and, you know, all, all sorts of platforms, then you might not be as successful as she is in that she is consistently growing and she does have an increasing platform and when she first started out she grew kind of a lot faster compared to her other peers who like started out at the same level as her in terms of audience and followers but I thought the most insightful thing she said was that to her it doesn't exactly matter how she looks because um, she cannot control how she looks like we can't control how we look like when we're born right we're just it's the genetic lottery whether we've won it or not and how we decide whether we've won this genetic lottery is really so dependent on how society defines beauty at that time so yeah she was saying because the notion of beauty is defined by society and that that in itself is of course dependent on the kind of culture and the time that you live in. Like beauty is not a binary thing. It's very fluid, it changes. We have seen it change so much throughout history. For the combination of these two in that you cannot control how you look, nor can you um, as a singular person define what beauty looks like. She said that therefore she doesn't feel pride in uh, how she looks like. I guess like not really taking credit for what she was really born with in terms of her looks. So I just thought that was a really interesting way of looking at it like with movements like body positivity going around and more inclusive notions of beauty opening up which I totally support. I do think that on a personal level for me, 
I also don't want to take pride of how I look like, what I am born with because I didn't ask to look like this, I didn't construct it in any way and whether I'm considered pretty or not, beautiful or not, hot or not is really, it's very relative and it's relative to what the society thinks at that point in time. So who knows, like a hundred years from now, I could be considered like the ugliest living creature on earth. <laughs> or I could be considered, I don't know, even even more desirable. Maybe short people had it have it better like a hundred years from now. Or the thing is that we just don't know. Um, and because beauty and notions of beauty are not fixed standards, I think that brings me comfort. <laughs> in a weird way, like it just shows how fickle humans are um, and that our notions of things, our perceptions of things or even our understanding really changes as time goes by. Okay, quick break. I'm going to go for my sunscreen now. I talked about this in a vlog before. It's uh, La Roche-Posay Mattifying Touch Effect. I just like it because it makes my skin a bit more matte because it's quite oily. Okay, because my face is super dry now and tacky from like my moisturizers and stuff, it doesn't go on smoothly. So I kind of just have to like tap it in. Almost like a foundation kind of texture. It looks a bit funny but I have no choice. Also, the second cream that I was putting on just now is the Centella Blemish Cream by CauseRx. It's just helping me to calm down some of my redness from uh, scars as well as any existing blemishes. Okay, so that's skincare done. Now I'm just gonna go grab my quote-unquote makeup stuff and then we'll get to the real get ready with me. Okay, I've got my mirror, got my makeup stuff, and I am going to attempt to do a natural, a natural makeup look, except still having my own features, of course, so kind of like an enhanced version of me, because I would not dare attempt to do some kind of magical eye look, because that's just way out of my scope. Alright, I'm starting off with my only foundation and concealer which is Body Shop Matte Clay Skin Clarifying Foundation in Japanese Maple 034. I do kind of apply everything with my fingers again because I do not trust my brushes which have been used to do very intense dance makeup. I do like little dollops of however much I need. Today I'm going to be a little bit more adventurous and try to cover up more of my redness and my scars. So I kind of just dab it on the areas and then tap it with my fingers to try and blend it out. So what I really wanted to touch on today as well is the news of all the mergers that have been taking place at NUS for the past couple months. The most recent of which is of course the Yale NUS and USP one. So what I noticed recently is the different response um, from all these different mergers. So I would classify it into like the NUS faculty mergers versus the Yale NUS and USP merger because um, on one hand for the Yale NUS and USP merger there was and there is such an outcry over it whereas I think for all the NUS mergers they were all kind of received with quite little fanfare. There was a bit of a talking point when all of them came out, you know, like FAS and Science together for CHS, College of Humanities and Sciences. Like, a, a, the tiniest little bit of buzz, maybe. My friends and I talked about it for maybe like five minutes and after that was, okay, whatever. Whereas when the new college news broke out, it was just like out of this world. <laughs> there was so much online feedback about it. Um, I saw it from my friends in Yon US, people that I knew that were there. Um, some from USP as well and a lot of news media reporting it and not just in like a factual light but also reporting about how students were reacting to it like the petitions, the no more top down like the feedback that was on the ground that was collected and also reported into mainstream media and that got me wondering why I as a student from FAS don't have the same reaction as when I found out that FAS and FOS had merged. 
even though if you don't look at it too closely it can kind of be perceived as parallel events like like in essence they are all simply mergers of different faculties or facets of institution but while i was pretty much unbothered by like the fest and fos one i just see i just saw so much like genuine emotion from the students who were affected by the Yon US and USP merger. And I feel that one of the possible reasons is because of how intricately the students from uh, either YNC or USP kind of derive their self-identity from being in that school. And I don't mean it in a bad way. And as much as I, coming from College of Alice and Peter Tan, even though I only stayed there for two years, like so much of my uni life revolved around that place and I like wholeheartedly and proudly identify with being in, like a captain. And of course I've I've learned so much and I've grown so much from being in that place. So um, I can therefore imagine why USP students and Yale US students, the latter of which have to stay in the in the campus grounds for four years, not just two, would feel so like emotionally and like mentally tied to the institution itself. And you know what? If I got into Yale and US, I'll be super heckin' proud of being that. And even just that, like I can imagine how excited you would be to engage in the kind of rigor and liberal arts education that um, Yon US so touts, which is so different from what all the other unis in Singapore can offer to students. So in contrast, I feel that me being a FAS student, knowing that FAS would essentially no longer exist, because even though there will still be the physical building and FAS students under CHS will go to FAS to attend their lessons and stuff, the ped pedagogy, ped pedagogy, <laughs> the original curriculum of the arts education will no longer be there and everything that I know it as a FAS student um, for the past two years is essentially not going to be the same anymore. But was I very concerned when the news came out? Not exactly, not really, until I did my own digging today. And that's when I realized that I don't necessarily think of FAS as something that is very much me as much as being kept, being in kept was me. I've never had a lot of my social interactions in FAS. Um, it's just a place for me to take my lessons. And apart from that, it hasn't really given me anything much in terms of like friendships and bonds and and character growth and character development. So when that news first broke out, I was definitely more on the apathetic side and it didn't really occur to me to go and protest about this merger. Also because I knew um, nothing that we students can say or do will likely change anything, especially for a very um, mostly unvocal lot within like the arts and sciences faculty. Um, I'm done with Concealer slash foundation. I'm just gonna move on to brows now. Using this extremely old mini so brow pencil, which is in like a brown color. So I was doing research on the new CHS this morning because due diligence, you know? And my most prominent thought is that I wish that NUS had involve students more in the process of coming up with these new mergers and new curriculums because it seems kind of ridiculous to me that they wouldn't have thought to consult either current or former or even entering students about what they want to see in a university. And yeah, you can use the argument that, you know, kids are young and foolish, um, at 18 you don't really know what you want to do with your life, you don't know anything about the world. Yes, but Making decisions in this very top-down manner, which we will see, is such a trend for Singapore and for Singaporean institutions is that it completely isolates the people who are going to be affected itself. I had read that for the NUS faculty mergers and particularly for CHS, that the deans of our schools, so the deans of arts and science and maybe the dean of science as well, um, were more involved than the decision that had been made for a new college. But nowhere were students ever asked to give our input on, hey, do we think this is a good idea? Do we really want this common curriculum? which is meant to help us with interdisciplinarity. As we know, it's really just for economic good, you know, to increase employability, to make us seem more employable. And while no one denies that economic growth is good for a country, like 
I don't take econs, I wouldn't dare to go into the technicalities of it but at some point we do have to ask at what cost, right? I was just reading a bit more on CHS, um, all my notes are here and they have to take like 13, 13 modules from the common curriculum which to me is crazy, like as a fast student who was in the Utown College program I had to take, what, 5 mods, that was like the old common curriculum but now you have to take 13 and it covers topics like artificial intelligence, communities and engagement, great, I mean I love that, digital literacy, design thinking, data literacy, scientific inquiry, Asian studies, etc. And while I do not deny the importance of these topics, um, we would be a fool to think that the world isn't going towards the direction of the computer sciences and, and AI and technology. But I just think that Singapore sets itself way too much into the areas of STEM. STEM is just over glorified here and as a result there is going to be a dilution of the art subjects that we have and it's the very reason why I chose to go to FES in the first place because I could experience a variety of arts related modules and subjects which I know that I want and because I don't want to do science like I go to FES because I know that I'm done with JC science I don't want to do that anymore, I just want to focus on what I like to do, which is arts. So I read this comment on Reddit, and I think it sums it up pretty well. The common core is already diluting degree specializations, and it also subsumes economic viability of many disciplines under the coming hegemony of computer sciences in the economy of the near future. And I just feel like the trend is to be very paternalistic in terms of management um, by NUS. Okay, eyelashes next. So I wish I had spoken up more about when CHS happened because even though I don't feel like much of my identity is tied to the faculty, I do think that the merger could have been handled much better um, in terms of transparency, in terms of involving students uh, in coming up with a new curriculum. I've read threads where people are just very confused about what the whole common curriculum is and honestly reading it myself just now, I was confused too, like I didn't... I get some of it but not all of it, all this interdisciplinary models, modules, the fact that some of them aren't even confirmed yet. It just makes me question why couldn't students have been involved from the get-go, informed along the way, and even why weren't all these things settled before releasing the news? Like, if you haven't even settled your interdisciplinary modules yet, which you'll see on the CHS website, is currently like an unconfirmed state, why wouldn't you have settled that before releasing it to everybody and forcing students right now in CHS to be under much confusion about what they're going to take? And another point to that is, and I'm sure most people would have seen this loophole by now is that if you're going to push that onto people then there will be no enthusiasm in the learning itself like who is actually going to be interested in learning about AI and data literacy which are all fantastic topics but uh, it doesn't guarantee that students are going to like them especially if they already know what chosen track they want to go into and if you lose that enthusiasm, then there isn't going to be much learning and growth, is there? You know, you can't force someone to learn what they don't want to and what they don't want to retain. It might just end up becoming a game of SU, which ultimately doesn't create the kind of, again, interdisciplinary students that you want to cultivate, but rather like a bunch of coerced students who feel like they have been forced to take subjects that they don't want to and are wasting those subjects on like MCs that could have been used are directed towards their own specializations which they have already figured out possibly after like 18 plus years of education and this transparency I feel is also very much if not even more so lacking in the new college merger I've seen so many complaints that you know the decision was not informed to students nor even senior members of the Yale and US management until when it broke out or very or very close to when the news was first released released to uh, the public at large. And that is really really telling. Like why would you not tell your students, you know, beforehand 
giving them ample time to think over it, to weigh in. Do you do it because you know they will agree or you know that they would disagree, honestly speaking? So, I mean, the communication efforts here are severely lacking. Yeah, so as I was reading about it, I also read a few articles by The Octant, which is a Yale and US run like student article website. And I'll put a link in the description down below to some of these articles because I think they explain it way better than I could. And it really helps to see what the scope of the situation is like in terms of why having a liberal arts education in Singapore is important to the students that get to access it. What it means for like our educational landscape, so to speak. Yeah, I think NUS has a really, really long way to go in terms of how it communicates to students and how it actually makes decisions um, which resulted in that whole no more top-down thing in the first place. Change to get the finishing shot. The lippy that I used was this one by Body Shop and I could not tell you what it is because it has been thoroughly, thoroughly rubbed off. If you stayed all the way to the end, thank you so much for listening to my rambles about the state of our education system. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me for a little bit and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!